Good morning, everybody. It's Bob Fibbs, the retail doc. Thanks for joining me. Sorry for the little uh, interruption there. Apparently, StreamYard did not want to talk to me this morning. So we had a little technical difficulty. So do me a favor, type in wherever you're joining me from. I haven't been able to join you for a while. And with Labor Day coming up next week, I thought, let's do it today. So do me a favor, type in where you are joining me from. I appreciate it. And uh, it always takes a little while to do that. You know, some people uh, tell me how, oh, I'm leaving Facebook. I'm leaving social media. Uh, I, it's too much to, has, to uh, hassle with. And I get it. I have to think of what am I going to put up there every single day? And then what am I going to come back with in the afternoon and all of that? But I hate to tell you, it's not going to go away. And whether you like it personally or not, we kind of need to stay with it because it is replacing organic uh, SEO. What does that mean? It means that more people are going to find you through what you do on social than they are by typing in and going your URL. Hey, Rachel, glad you're here from Wisconsin. So uh, do me a favor. And again, type in where you're joining me from. This week, I asked a question about what was something uh, that you were really good at that... um, you're a little embarrassed to tell people. So let's just get this out of the way. Uh, I uh, have this freakish thing that my dad taught me when I was a child, which was to be able to wiggle my ears. So there you go. And I can even do one. There's one, that one. I don't know if you can see. I have a high def, uh, I have a high def uh, camera today, but I'm not sure if you can see that. In any event, it's always fun to post those kind of questions out there whether you're on uh, Facebook or other ones, because everybody likes to talk. Everybody likes to find out, you know, like what's one thing from the 80s that people don't say anymore. And I don't know, I must have 5,000 comments on that post from several weeks ago. It's still going strong because Facebook is showing all of those posts to more people who aren't even my customers. So just understand that it's always going to come down to what do you do to keep people engaged? That's, uh, if you remember the last couple of years, I did one of these every single Sunday and it was great. It adds a lot of, uh, you know, mix to it that people find out they can see you authentically, right? Your hair's a little off or you're trying to get ready. Uh, but how many of those convert to buyers and influence you? And it's, it becomes easy to say, well, I did a video and nothing happened, but I will tell you, I've had more signups in the last week than we have in a while. And I'm always surprised to hear people say, I've been watching your videos for years. So it's a matter of being consistent. So today I'm being consistent, which is at least once a month, I want to do one on Sunday mornings to keep you all there. Hey, Jamie Lee, glad you're here from Montreal, Canada. So uh, I've asked for several of your questions. By the way, if you're watching this live, you can type in your questions and I will answer it the best I can. Uh, My goal is always to help not hurt. So I have a very long one from Sandra yesterday and you can read through it. Uh, You went through and this is a book of all the things that you've done and how you do all of these things. Hey, Alex, glad you're here this morning. Look forward to seeing you guys in October. and, uh, you know, you kind of go on that you're uh, you're doing all these things to market yourself and you're looking for ideas. And uh, I'm only here to help not hurt Sandra. So I did actually take a little moment and I wanted to go back and find out what is this place that you are spending so much time on. And you obviously have a lot of creativity because the name of your store is Weird Sisters Freak Boutique and you're in Astoria. And uh, I looked at your reviews. You know, somebody says the best thrift shop experience bar, weird art cave in town. Uh, Somebody else said the literally the coolest place I've ever been. The owner of the shop was so cool and wonderfully weird. So I get it. You're kind of an art gallery with a lot of experiential things with resale. And you're talking about all the ways that you've tried to uh, market yourself. And when it really comes down to it, though, you say you're pretty much a one person shop. And my concern is all of the um, trying to get people to come, uh, you're not target. You're using mass uh, uh, ways to try to get people to see it and then know. But in the very name of your store, which is Weird Sisters Freak Boutique, um, that's going to put a lot of people off. And there's a lot of people that may not want that. So I would encourage you to be thinking of asking your own customers, how did they find you? You're, you're probably a lot of college students that are coming there um your i think i and i watched your video which was great your video on your facebook page um you said you have that weirdo you don't know who to buy for you'll find it here 
But I think the the challenge is always going to be when someone is this creative and passionate. I think you can be a lot of places all over the uh, all over the thing without being really focused on are you converting and getting more sales from the people that are in there. And it looks like a very large space on camera. And I don't know how you could be in all those rooms and all those places uh, because I, I saw people, you know, are videoing you. But is that making you money? That's what I always come back to. That just getting people to come isn't really the the um, the job. It's getting them to convert. And I'm not here to tell you what uh, you're doing wrong or anything like that. I'm just saying what I look at. You ask for some help, and I would say you need to probably work more on your getting video and figuring out how do you keep in front of people so that it's shareable content and Instagram. But just be very careful that if it's really about coming to this experience, which is this art installation, maybe there's a admission charge that you would consider doing um, as, as you're looking at it. Because you're right, I don't see how resale works that, you know, I'm not a resale guy. I'm, I'm full price retailers, that's who hires me. Um, and having online stores that can be able to do that, I think is just really hard. So I think you're smart to stay away from it. I hope that helps. Uh, glad you're here this morning, uh, Stace and uh, Tahir, glad you're there. Noreen asks me, uh, I'm curious how stores are planning sales inventory for next year. Are they planning for an increase? Are they even are behind? Uh, I think it, it's all over the map. I have one of my luxury customers who was telling me they're up over 30% over last year. She's making her buys for March, uh, full speed ahead. Um, she told her crew uh, she had too many hangers uh, here, which means that you need to uh, sell more because she doesn't want to have the hangers. And then she also said that also means I need to get more merchandise in here. So I hope that helps as well. As well. Uh, so I think it just comes down to if you are planning to have a soft uh, you know, Q4 and Q1 of next year, I think you're going to get it. I think if you uh, always approach a buying opportunity, whether they're coming to your store or going to a show, how am I going to sell these? That's the ticket. I think so many times people buy what they like. And then when it doesn't sell, they're like, oh, it didn't sell. But did you buy it with the attitude of how many of these do I have to sell to get to break even, right? So if you buy a dozen uh, units of clothing, let's say, and your employees buy four of them right off the bat where it's uh, at cost, then you have to ask yourself, well, what do I need to sell to be able to make at least get my money and then some back? And that's difficult. And so that takes some planning. So I, I hope, Noreen, that helps. Again, my goal is always to help not hurt, but it really comes down to thinking about what are the tools you're going to use to move that inventory. All right. Rachel says, what are you saying here? Rachel says, hi, Bob. What's a fun activity to engage my sales team when morale feels down, sales have cooled down uh, 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 normal August? <laughs> I love that. Uh, well, Rachel, I always say, you know, um, you can come up with a scenario uh, where you could do a store meeting and you give them the terms. I don't know what your store sells offhand, but let's just say a guy and a gal come into your store. The guy has never been in your store. The wife is looking for, let's say, a pair of rain boots. Go. And they have five minutes to come up with the biggest add-on sale they can possibly think of. So when they come back, they have to tell you the narrative, which is how do they get there, right? They can't just come back with a bunch of stuff. They have to come back and logically tell you how this works. So that's one way you can do it. Another one is to find the uh, one piece of uh, clothing and merchandise in your store that you absolutely hate. So everybody loves to do that. They're like, this is the ugliest thing. It's like, great. Now come up with five reasons somebody should buy it. Uh, well, uh, uh, it's like, great. Tell me who it's going to be able to be for. How are they going to use it? What is it? Because what you focus on usually is what moves, right? And car dealers have known this for years. They end up ordering the ugliest car, right? It's lime green with plaid seats with blue um, piping or wh whatever. And uh, they put it right up front and it's the one that sells immediately. But what it does is it gets them to start looking at the other cars better. And I think that's the same thing too. So that's two things you can do. And uh, then the other one would be find the most complex item you have in your store. So if it's electronics or it's, um, you know, maybe it's uh, maybe it's a piece, you know, maybe if I've got a scarf, Stacy's on here, if I've got a scarf that is $8,000, right, it must have all kinds of features and benefits, right? You must have a whole backstory of how it all done. 
and you say, great, explain this to a teenager for me. Explain this to a fifth grader for me. Explain this to your grandmother. And what you're trying to do is fire those synapses to look at the merchandise differently. You say you're in flooring. So uh, same thing with flooring that, you know, find the most expensive, ugliest flooring you can imagine. Great. I know it. Uh, great. Show, uh, tell me what the house is. Go online and come back with five pictures from Pinterest or Instagram where this flooring would look great. Give me a backstory of someone who came in for um, our most basic floor and how you're going to bring them up there. But the key for all of it comes down to you're only looking for them to fire new synapses. If I fire new synapses, new things open up. And so to your point, when things get down and we get a little tired, then I think it becomes really easy to just like, oh, there's nobody coming in. It's so slow. Oh, did you, you know, clean the bathroom again? Whatever it's going to be. The hard thing for most of us as leaders is keeping our minds engaged enough to always think it's about coming up with something for my crew to do so that they'll end up being excited when the customer comes in. Let's face it. You know, if you're in flooring, you're in, in home furnishings, anywhere, you know, it was duck and cover the last two years. We have it in stock. Oh, it's here today. Buy it or it's gone tomorrow. Well, that worked, except now you have a lot in stock. Now you can get a lot of things. A lot of things are, are going to be available at a lot of your competitors as well. So you can't use that sales uh, thought. At the same time, your customers are all hearing the big R word. Oh, everyone's pulling back, you know, and why everyone keeps quoting Walmart that, oh, Walmart's only selling half gallons of milk. That means people are trying to st stretch their budget. No, people who are trying to stretch their budget are like my mom who would buy a half gallon of milk and then get carnation instant milk and mix that together to make a gallon of milk, which just made all the milk taste terrible and tried to make her money go. No, the reason they're only buying half gallons of milk is they're not at home as much. They're out doing, they're out seeing things. And to say, oh, the people with a hundred grand are all pulling back. Well, maybe they are, but maybe they're just saying these items that I would normally buy don't, I, I'm not valuing as much because I'm buying the Birkin bag uh, that I've always wanted or whatever it is. I'm not hearing people saying that they're not buying things, uh, they're economizing. But if we take that mindset, then we let that come into our sales floor. And now your employees are saying, oh, well, this is on sale this week. This is you can get a rebate in that. And that's all they can sell from because now they've moved from duck and cover. Oh, my God. To, oh, my God, no one's buying and it's too expensive. I don't want to freak them out. So I hope that helps. Uh, that was a lot there for you. <laughs> oh, Rachel, yeah, thank you so much. I'm glad that helps. I'm glad that helps. Uh, hey, good, glad you're here from Portugal. Tim, I'm glad to see you, Mr. Tim. Glad to see you. That's excellent. That's excellent. Uh, we have uh, backstories, whoever this Facebook user is. The time is so worth it for us because people just can't visualize things or have a split second to decide on my store to make a decision whether they need or not. Nobody needs whatever you sell. I can guarantee you whatever you sell. Whoever you are, nobody needs it. They want it. The money is always in the wants, not the needs. So I hope that helps. Uh, top fan Rose says, hiring is hard these days. It's always been hard. Uh, is it better to hire five competent part-timers or two full-time employees. I'm trying to be flexible. So Rose, that's very funny. Uh, do I want five competent part-timers or just two full-time employees who are not competent? I think what you mean is they're both competent. Uh, I always personally would rather have people who could work more hours with me, whether that's 30 or 40 hours, that's that's not as important. What I, I feel a lot of retailers have done these days is we hired part-time people who can work one day a week or or two days here. And the problem with that is you are down on the third or fourth most important priority. It's gonna be really hard to train them. It's gonna be really hard to get them excited. And it's really gonna end up making it harder for you to schedule a lot of times because they are just filling this little niche. So when you really need them, can you come in Wednesday? No, I'm, I'm at the coffee house or I'm at my day job or I'm babysitter or I'm teaching or whatever. That can become a little bit more, but you know what? Someone's going to rail on me and say, oh, well, that's not uh, that's not what we do. Well, good for you. I'm just saying you asked me, I think the more hours you can give somebody, the better. And uh, again, you even if, you know, we have a lot, I have several followers who, you know, pride to tell me, oh, it's just me. You can't be two people. You can't be in two places. You're oftentimes wed to a store that, um, is it really making you money? And you haven't figured out how to train someone. So you just keep doing everything yourself. 
And I'm just telling you that can be really deflating and really hard to do. I used to do it for retail doc and I've got three people uh, now and they always say, how did you do this before? Just drink a lot. Uh, you, you just can't do it. And those of you who are bigger retailers, I think the challenge there as well is because it's so hard to manage two or 300 people, we just say, well, whatever works, works. But quite simply, we are seeing people coming back to retail. We're seeing uh, the great unretirement is what I'm hearing, that people are coming back and saying, I really want to deal with you know, the public more. Maybe they're not going to come back at 40 hours a week. Maybe they're going to come back at 30. But I would take that any day over someone that can work 10 hours. That's way too much time uh, on that rose, but I hope that helps. All right. Uh, yes, and the rest of the team has to pick up their slack. I love that. I love that. That's great. That's great. Uh, hey, Hassan from uh, Belgium. Glad you're here today. All right. My last question, unless you have something for me today, I always try to get to about 15 minutes. We're about 15 minutes. So if you have a question, do me a favor and type it in while I'm still live and give me some thumbs up and let me know you're out there. If you're on uh, LinkedIn, I think you're able to applaud and Facebook is loves and uh, thumbs up. But uh, as you know, algorithms only work if you're commenting and you're going back and forth and sharing. So do me a favor. I'm not charging you for this. Uh, help me out. All right. So there we go. And Tim, I'm getting a lot of people from Australia lately who are joining SalesRx. So what's that about? I love that. Maybe it's your good words out there in the world. So I appreciate that. Uh, Corinne says, what should you start advertising a... When should you start advertising a customer appreciation event, radio ads, social media, in-store handing out promo material to all customers? So, Corinne, I usually say that's about a two-week max, although I am curious. Customer appreciation typically isn't something that's mass marketed on radio and all these other things. So is it really just a sale and you're using that as customer appreciation? Because to me, if it's customer appreciation, you're using your either your email or your physical mailing address, and you know those people. So it's a very tight group, and you're going to give them options, right? Can they reserve uh, wish items? Can they make an appointment during this time? Uh, all of that. If it's just to say a customer appreciation event, I think um, it gets lost if you're going to do a mass spray and pray. So I hope that helps. Uh, and the most important thing for all of you to just know is that we can change the world by the people working in shopping and retail. And, you know, as I wrap up this broadcast today, just remember that you are the one responsible to make your employees day from that, that makes your customers day. The days of saying, oh, you know, go over here, move this, uh, transfer this, sort this. If you can lean, you can clean. Those are over. Your whole job is to make your employees Think when they're on the floor, put new synapses together, and really understand the psychology of selling and engaging as strangers who are coming out of a pandemic world and an always-on news cycle that makes them feel terrible. They walk into a retail store to feel better. They walk in with hope. If you can't match that, if you don't have employees who love waiting with the customer and enjoying it, they're pretty much going to be met with, can I help you, which is almost like pouring of fuel on the or water on the fire and making them feel worse for having come to your destination. Your job is to find a way to make them feel that one, it was the right decision to go through traffic and uh, all the other nonsense to get to your store, that you make them feel that they matter. And that shows from the moment you, you greet them and the way your, your crew handles it uh, all the way through making sure that they buy something and not just tell you, oh, you have a nice store, I'll be back. That doesn't pay the bills. And if you want help with that, I'm my online training, SalesRx, salesrx.com can help you with that. We are literally training people on four continents and a variety of languages, how to engage a stranger, discover the shopper and make the sale. If you're looking to grow your sales, well, then you should probably be looking at, at things like that. But, but it all comes down to thinking that training is something we do. It's not something we did at onboarding four or five years ago. And if you understand that, then you have fun when you're coming to work and your employees have fun and you're not just waiting for the day to end or for be able to unbox something that takes you out of having to wait for a customer, right? Because customers are what is the lifeblood of retail. It's what makes this fun, makes it exciting. And if you also look at your employees, you're looking forward to them, to coming to work with them, that's great. If you're coming to work thinking, oh my God, I've got to work with John again, that's on you. If, you, only you can change that. If you're going to wait for John to change it, I can guarantee you the mind will have left uh, six weeks to six months before the body ever did. So make sure that you understand that. And when it gets right down to it, 
understand that we're about as happy as we make our minds up to be. So use your choice muscle. We all have things going on. We all have things that we wish were better, or different, the past, all that other stuff. Just make sure you're choosing to make your day great because only you can do that. Not me, not the news, not your kitten. Maybe, all right, maybe your kitten. All right, probably your dog. All right, with that, I'm Bob Fibbs, The Retail Doc. Thanks for joining me today, and I hope to see you again soon.